Okay, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Tobias Heister. I'm trying to talk a bit about uh, segment routing, traffic engineering based on an open source controller. It's actually part two of an ongoing um, series of talks which started two years ago, but I'll cover that in a minute. Um, first of all, who am I? Um, I'm working for Zantaro, service architect, pro, uh, not a service provider, uh, service integrator, um, doing boring stuff like technical pre-sales, being technical conscious of our account management guys uh, during the daytime, um, doing more interesting stuff like um, running our XT3 lab facilities, where I did a talk last year, and most importantly, stuff like solutions engineering, which most of the talk today is about. Um, it's actually looking into vendors technologies and looking into the market, how it evolves, what might become a product at one point. Also, we are kind of the gateway into our company, our sol the solution architecture team, so whenever a new technology or vendor actually emerges or comes along, it has to pass us in order to get into the company. Um, yeah. Then, of course, I've got an obligatory marketing slide, which will, I will quickly skip over because it's nothing to do with the talk, but you'll have to have them any in there anyway. Um, Short idea about what the talk is all about today. Um, I will do a short recap into what segment routing is all about anyway. Um, we did a talk two years ago on that, um, which is way more detailed, so it will only be a brief overview. Um, I will have a look into um, the actual SR controller architecture we build, parts and bits of pieces we used, give you a high-level walkthrough overview of the UI, which yeah, basically uses all of the backend data, and um, in the end, give a couple of building blocks and there's a, yeah, it, it's actually put into, into the colons there, a roadmap, stuff we would like to add to this uh, thing at one point. So, as I mentioned, um, the journey actually started two years ago, right here in this auditorium, when a colleague of mine who's in the audience um, as well did our first talk on segment routing. Um, there's way more information in that talk. Luckily, um, C the CCC guys um, the, from C 3 c Rock uh, actually recorded that two years ago, so you can re-watch and relive that anytime you want to. Um, so, the next slides will only be a very brief introduction into the topic, and it's by no means um, a complete overview of the, the idea at all. Um, for those of you who don't know, segment routing or, or spring, as it is uh, used interchangeably, is actually a label signaling protocol for MPS, MPS labels. So before we are looking into spring, let's have a look back of what we had in the past. We actually had two yeah, choices to signal labels inside an autonomous system. The first was obviously LDP, which is by name the label distribution protocol. That's what it does. Um, it exchanges labels between nodes. By default, it provides any-to-any -any connectivity to enable you to build end-to-end -end LSPs between uh, elements in your network. Um, it has not much control plane overhead. There's still a control plane running because, yeah, LDP has to uh, build up neighbors and exchange labels and all of that, but it's pretty straightforward. Problem with LDP is there's basically no traffic engineering. It will always follow the shortest path that your IGP, like ICS or SPF, um, has actually pre-generated for you. Um, it can provide stuff like fast failover, so the famous sub-50 millisecond failover scenarios by using IP um, loop-free alternate, which is more or less a function of your IGP and not a function of, of LDP. Um, so it's a pretty standard way of doing label distribution if you don't need any traffic engineering. So, But if you want to force your traffic onto specific passes, what actually has been used in the past was RSVP. To be more precise, it's RSVP TE, because RSVP was a QS protocol back in the day and the traffic engineering part was bolted on. What it actually does is it explici explicitly signals LSPs through the network on a very distinct pass. It can run a constrained shortest pass force algorithm, so you can give a couple of constraints that it will actually use to you, uh, build the pass. You can actually nail down to a specific, um, to, to, to a specific path in your network to actually yeah, instruct it where it, it needs to forward traffic through your network. Problem with that, it, it creates a lot of state in the network. Um, the example um, on the bottom there shows you four PE routers, and we are only looking into the ingress LSPs, um, because most of you probably know um, LSPs are only unidirectional, so you always need one from ingress to egress and then the other way around. So each of these PEs would have three LSPs in order to reach each of the other guys. The guy in the middle, the poor P router in the middle, would already have to handle the state of 12 LSPs with state machine um, and all of that um, attached 
approach to that. Um, it gets worse if you put stuff like fast reroute into the picture, where we have lots of bypass LST, LSPs, D2 LSPs, especially if we are running the one-to-one the -one backup mechanism. It doesn't really scale that good. So somebody came up with a new idea um, about um, label signaling, which is called segment routing or spring. Spring is more or less the IETF term. Segment routing is what is more used in marketing. It was originally coined by Cisco. So if you're talking about the IETF stuff, it's mostly spring. And as we've run out of acronyms in the industry, we now need to actually carve the, the, the letters out of the words in between. So spring is actually source packet routing in networking to get a meaningful acronym for our new protocol. Um, the idea in Spring is um, envision your network as a series of segments. Um, I will cover segments in a minute. And your network path through, enter uh, enter network path is actually yeah, um, a summary of all of the segments it has to pass through. What is a segment in segment routing? A segment can be a node. Um, a segment always has a segment identifier, a SID. So a node will have a node SID, a node segment identifier. A link between two nodes, which is called an adjacency in the segment routing world, will have an adjacency SID segment identifier. And there are lots of additional stuff you can get, um, yeah, basically use identifiers for. There is any cast SID and lots of interesting stuff, which we've covered in the other talk. But for now, the main part is you can address a node and you can address a specific segment to actually uh, forward traffic to. Um, the nice thing is, it's not an additional protocol because, hey, what we needed, uh, what we actually did not need at all, is to have an additional protocol running in a network. It's actually an extension of existing protocols. So it runs on top of your IGP, ISAS, or OSPF. There are even drafts and implementations existing to bolt that on top of BGP as well. So you don't need additional protocols. Of course, you need to do an uplift of code on your equipment at one point to get the new features in. It's a bit easier to get these features into ISAS than into the OSPF, at least V2, um, but it's doable over the years. Um, the main idea now is, how do I get traffic engineering into the mix? I am able to actually address each node and each segment in the network, so I can pre-calculate and pre-build a path for the traffic that actually needs to go from A to B. The next slide tries to give a short example of how this is actually achieved. It's a small example network. Um, the um, red colored labels which are associated to the routers are actually the node sets. These are actually the MPLS labels we would use in order to address these nodes. And the bluish ones which are there are the adjacency labels, the adjacency SIDs I talked about earlier. So somehow, ISIS, OSPF, whatever, every router in the network knows that these labels are there and they know how to actually reach these labels either by indirect neck top or by direct neck top. What you would then do in order to actually signal an explicit path throughout the network is on the Ingress router, which is R1 in this example, you would actually attach a label stack to the IP packet. Kind of feels like the story that uh, Oliver told us yesterday about the degree header uh, stacking and the MPLS header stacking. Well, it's basically the exact same idea here in segment routing. Um, in this specific example, what we would do is we would attach three labels because we have two loose segments in our network and one very strict segment to do the RSVP uh, speak. Um, the first label, which is um, 205, actually instructs the router to take the shortest IGP pass towards router 5. Each node in the network knows by exchanging these labels via, via OSPF that the best route to take is via router R3 to R5. The second label in the stack would be 524, which is actually the adjacency identifier for the direct link between router 5 and router 4. And last but not least, once the uh, frame actually reaches router 4, the last label comes into play, which tells you to go to um, 208, which is router 8 in that case. And by stacking these three labels on top of our packet on Ingress, we can actually steer traffic through our network um, without any of the intermediate nodes having any forwarding state, besides obviously building the label FIP. But none of them is involved in actually um, yeah, keeping state for this traffic engineering tunnel or whatnot, all of the state and all of the policy stuff is more or less done on the, the Ingress node. There's, there's no state for that, that LSP, so um, don't, don't get me wrong there. It's the policy stuff. Um, one of the big challenges is somebody has to know which labels to actually use and to push on the Ingress packets in order to achieve what you actually want to achieve. Um, that's not that easy because, yeah, today there's limited options to actually do that. 
Um, the quick summary for that, um, that part of the segment um, routing bit is, there are a couple of advantages to using segment routing in your network. Um, the policy state, so the actual path a packet should take through a network is in the actual packet header by attaching MPLS labels. This can become a downside because you might have to attach a large stack of labels on the ingress node, which not every kit in the network can actually do. Most of the um, proprietary ASICs can easily stack six, seven, eight uh, labels. Some uh, merchant silicon can only uh, add three or four labels, but some of them can also do five, six, seven labels. Um, there is no midpoint state anymore in RSVP. All of the guys have to actually yeah, have state for the RSVP tunnel, so that's totally gone. There's no extra protocol. It runs in ISS or IGP, so you can, if you don't rely on LDP for service signaling, like um, layer two circuits or LDP signaled uh, VPLS, you can get rid of one or two protocols in your network, which is always nice because it kind of um, simplifies your network. Um, right away, on most implementations, it can be a drop-in replacement for LDP because without any policy at all, it will just behave like LDP. Use the shortest pass uh, only on Juniper. It will just install routes into INET3, which can be used by any service right away. Um, the traffic engineering part, by design and by start, actually supports a distributed model where each of the ingress routers actually has to do policy and uh, ingestion. But there's also basically the idea of having the centralized computation and the centralized element in there from the beginning. And, and by design, while in RSVP or LDP network, this kind of felt bolted on with stuff like PSAP or BGPLS, which then later was introduced and was never really completely integrated. Disadvantages is so far, on existing network kit, there's next to no real policy support to actually build these policies to stack labels on your ingress router. Um, so in most of the real-world use cases, you would have to find someone to build your static LSP uh, push mechanisms. There's now a bit of uh, moving forward in this. There's a couple of ITF drafts and also RFCs. By now, um, some vendors have integrated stuff. Juniper has, uh, has done something. Cisco has done something on ISXR. So you can now kind of mimic the policy framework that ISVP had in place at one point. But it's still not completely idea yet. Um, if you actually do the distributed approach, the challenge so far was, um, yeah, which controllers could you actually use? So which solutions could you actually use to push the stuff back into your network and get the information out? There's a couple of commercial ones uh, be available. Um, Juniper Norstar comes to mind, which does millions of things besides pushing that, that pass. So obviously, it's a pretty good solution, but it's also pretty expensive if you only want that specific part of the solution. Um, there are no other uh, propriety uh, solutions as well, but there are no, no real open source solutions to that. And yeah, that's where we thought, hey, let's try to, to build something which is usable um, as a kind of proof of concept idea. So let's see how far open source can take us uh, in, this, in this journey, and that's what we did. One important thing, the next slides are about stuff that I did not write myself. A colleague of mine did that actually, Markus Fahrenkamp, probably watching um, the stream right now because he couldn't be here today. Um, basically, he got inspired by our SR talk two years ago, and he was very surprised that there is no real open source project or scenario available yet, at least two years ago when we started um, this whole journey. Um, yeah, he's doing a DC IP MPLS stuff, so stuff of that touches his daily business as well. Most of the stuff which we are talking about in here is done in, on his spare time or when he was off projects. So, um, yeah. Just a general shout out. Um, the next slide is there to give a scary overview of the overall architecture. We will only be here for a very short time. I will now dive into the, the details of the architecture we built, and we will revisit this overall architecture slide in the end. The first step is we actually have to extract data out of the network into our, um, into our controller infrastructure. We are doing that by using a protocol called BGPLS for BGP link state. Don't know if everybody in the room actually knows that protocol. It's a protocol to stream out information from your, the network. It can stream out link state information. That's where the name link state uh, in, the, in the family came from. So you can actually stream out the topology information, um, even label information, which is distributed by any protocol, and also topology information, link state information, node information, so basically the whole topology. The nice thing is, in your, in your topology, only one of the guys actually has to export BGPLS to the controller or central instance. You don't need to extract this information from each and every node, of course, given that the topology is, is known by each of the guys uh, at one point. 
An alternative to that would have been to actually integrate the controller into, let's say, the ISIS domain. Um, but so far, there are not so many open source ISIS demons which you really want to use. And yeah, we just started with something which was there. Um, the nice thing is the BGP speaker we, we chose two years ago, XRBGP, had BGP LS support built in. Um, so we just went with that. There might have been better BGP demons out there. There might be better BGP demons today. But back in the day, it was available. It did all we, we needed it to do, so we used it. Um, there's an additional bit um, in the solution, um, which is um, shown down here. There's a small script in Python which actually extracts additional information from the network um, via some vendor-specific protocols. Might be NetConf uh, on the Juniper stuff if they actually support that. It is eAPI if we are querying stuff on Arista devices. That's mainly for adding additional information which is used for humans, like interface descriptions, interface names, which BGPLS does not really care about, but your operator or your uh, um, human people in front of this tool will actually care about because they can relate to the actual interfaces. Um, once we pre-computed the path in our tool, we actually have to push that back into the network. That's where BGPLU for labeled unicast comes into play. BGPLU enables you to announce prefixes with a stack of labels attached to it back into the network. So this will be our yeah, communication protocol to actually program stuff into the network in the end. Um, then what we actually did is we wrote a couple small bits and pieces, all built on, on, on smallish Python scripts, which all in their self do a specific piece of work and either send stuff out to a message queue or receive stuff via a specific message queue. Let's walk through the picture from, from top to bottom. Um, XRBGP will, via yeah, its actual textual output uh, channel, push all of the BGPLS messages out into our um, XRBGP driver that we wrote. This will actually convert these text matches to something which we can use. So it's, it's a JSON-based um, data model which we are using internally. Put that on one of the onto one of the message queues, and that's all it does. Then there's this other um, small module, which is the uh, BGPLS converter, which actually takes this JSON messages, makes something meaning meaningful out of that, and puts it into an internal Notify queue. There are actually two consumers of that queue. One is the um, node link collector that we already saw. Um, whenever there's a new node being signaled via BGPLS, it will then go to the network and will actually res uh, gather the information from that specific device. Um, and also, um, Marcus called it a REST API persistence module. This will actually take all of the information from the BGPLS converter and put it into the, the Redis sto uh, storage instance to be later consumed via the REST API um, to yeah, actually get the information available in there. Um, all of that is uh, run into via decentralized REST API. If we, for whatever reason, ever need to send something out to the network, as I mentioned, BGPLU message will be sent out via the XRBGPD. We are doing that via the um, XRBGP commands queue. Um, the REST API will then put the messages into the command queue, which will then be converted um, into the appropriate XRBGP commands, which will then send over to there. Um, the REST API I already talked about, all interaction from the outside world all only happens via the, the REST API, so even for our own web UI that we build, we are only consuming stuff that the REST API exposes. Um, there is an additional integration in there to actually get data out of a, a time series database, InfluxDB in our um, scenario. Um, we're doing telemetry streaming, so um, based on a second or five second interval, we are streaming data out of all of the devices we have got in that topology to our centralized infrastructure. And we don't want to talk any more about that. That could be in a whole talk of uh, spending about 30 minutes um, alone. For now, it's just important. We are consuming an existing TSDB. We even go as far as to use the Grafana web UI for graph visualization and are just exposing that into the web UI. But everything goes via the, the REST API, even interaction with the TSDB. It's not done directly by the web UI, it's done via the REST API. In the end, there is a web UI on top of that, which is just there for convenience purposes. Um, it's built on a couple of frameworks which you use these days. Um, we will walk through that in a minute, so I won't spend too much there. And the main app that we deployed there, app or feature, is that you can actually deploy a traffic engineering path in your network by just vis visually selecting the path through the network that it actually should take. Um, coming back to the overall architecture picture, hopefully it's a bit clearer than the, the initial idea. So we've got 
it decapsulated as much as possible. There's only a bit of integration with the actual network elements. If we ever feel like changing the interaction methods, we could, methods, we could easily do that by changing the modules on the uh, top left side. If we ever want to consume it differently than via our existing web UI, if we want to use it programmatically in some kind of script, we can always do that via the REST API. Um, what I want to do now is give you a quick overview of the UI and the features it has right now. It's more of the internal use case demonstrator for us that we can actually do something with the information. Um, the first thing, as we are all visual people, is it actually generates a nice visual representation of your network. Again, only by the data it got from BGPLS. So it doesn't do any additional magic um, to actually de, um, find out how the topology looks like. This is all data which is available via BGPLS already. In this specific example, we have a mixed topology of Juniper and Arista devices. Um, these are just two of our large partners, so we have them in our lab facilities and integrated them right away. Um, there's a bit of additional information in there, for example, the chassis type, the software version. This is all stuff which is gathered via the link node collectors. So whenever there's a new link coming up, there's a bit of additional data being pushed there, and it will do the nice visualization, show you how the stuff is interconnected, which is the base building block. Um, there's a bit of nice UI stuff. Beside the topology view, there's actually a list view with auto-completion where you can just search for a specific node. Once you um, hit enter, it will then actually focus on that specific node in the visualization because that's a pretty simple topology of only eight devices. Imagine um, running, running that on a larger topology of a meaningful network size. Um, I talked about the integration of, of, um, of, uh, yeah, of metrics um, via the TSDB. There's actually, these are just Grafana um, graphs that we integrated in the UI and we're just showing there. Um, by now, they're, I believe they're updating every five seconds. Um, so what we get in that UI is actually the live link utilization of each and every node and all of the interconnections between them for Juniper as well as for the Arista devices in there. Um, we actually built, uh, that's um, thanks, thanks and shout out to Florian who actually supported us in getting the telemetry data out of the, um, out of the Arista boxes into our uh, in the installation. So by now it's pretty easy to do that. Um, the real meat and the real use case for that is actually that we can now build a traffic engineering pass. And what we do is there is a small app. Um, then you click on record pass. Of course, it, gets, uh, it then will turn red because everything which gets recorded has to turn red at one point. What you then do is you visually select the nodes and link segments in your topology where your new traffic engineering pass should actually walk along. You provide the prefix that you actually want to program. So in that specific case, just an arbitrary slash 32, which we uh, need to forward in a different way. Then you click um, along the line. Down there, you can actually see the recorded, uh, the recorded path um, from P1 via core root to two. Then there are two numbers which seem a bit arbitrary. These are actually the internal identifiers of a specific node to node link, A and Z end. So it's an internal representation of what we have in the database. Afterward, it goes to P4 and then to core one. Um, and when you click on deploy prefix, the, all, all of the internal magic happens and what actually will be received on one of the, the nodes, that's a Juniper PE node in that uh, scenario, is a BGP LU root. It will more lo look and feel like a traditional BGP root, but the magic is um, that there will actually um, be a stack of labels attached to that root, which we'll see up here as well. Um, which will then do the magic forwarding I described in my uh, initial, um, uh, initial overview. Um, by that, we can actually push traffic to a specific prefix to a specific path in the network. If you imagine having our visual representation with live data um, being in there, so you know which link has which utilization, and you see a specific link is is highly utilized, other links are not really utilized at all. You find out which prefix are actually, um, yeah, which are actually used to generate that traffic. So there might be lots of traffic for a specific prefix, for a specific NubNet, going to a specific peer. You can, you can then use this infrastructure to actually steer the traffic away from that without actually touching your routers at all. I've talked about, about the high-level architecture. Let's see what's, what's under the hood. Um, it's actually a lot of stuff which you can get 
out there freely available. Um, that's the, the slide with all of the tools we actually used uh, in that. Everything has to be dockerized and uh, microservice these days, so all of that is running in a container. It can, it can also do some auto scaling if you actually need, uh, need more scripts. Um, XRBGP is in there not because we particularly like it, but because it has had all of the protocols in there that we actually need, namely BGPLS and BGPLU. Um, a message bus framework, Redis for storage, a bit of the UI stuff for, for representation, um, the telemetry stuff I talked about, and a couple of frameworks to actually do the, the front-end um, presentation. And the most important part, lots of duct tapes to actually glue that together at one point, lots of scripting stuff to actually make that work, um, build the, the change to actually do stuff in there. Um, so far, it has a couple of features I've already shown. Um, it gets specific information via BGPLS to actually build this infrastructure. Um, there is is the BGP um, Spring, uh, BGP LU Spring slash SR pass deployment, which I briefly showed you. There is the telemetry integration for a couple of vendors. There is multi vendor, only two vendors so far for gathering additional information, but this might grow over time. Um, right now, it's not really redundant or production ready because there's one extra BGP instance getting the information out via BGPLS and also only one instance getting the data back into the network. Also, it's not programming the states in a persistent way. So if for whatever reason Docker decides to just go away, all of your routes will go away and will start with an empty, empty plate afterwards. So there's plan to put some persistence into that as well to actually reprogram the paths into the network. Um, also, some server-side event scripting. So when if BGPLS actually shows you that an adjacency has gone down or a node has disappeared, we want to automatically update the visualization and the topology. It's currently, it is done only once on, on load, so a bit of, of convenient features. Um, also, right now, as you might have seen, um, there is no visual indication of how loaded a specific link is. And as each of us loves weather maps, there will probably be a visual representation at one point. Um, why did we do that in the first place? Well, because we can and we like to play around with new technology. Um, there's yet no use case, so there's no customer behind that who actually approached us and told us, hey, build that for us. But we like to stay ahead of the curve. So we, we looked into the BGP star, uh, BGP um, SSR, BGP Spring, BGP LU stuff, because yeah, we, we feel it might come around at one point. Um, although, um, as mentioned, when we did the talk two years ago, where we were just talking about technology and the bits and pieces in spring and segment routing, um, we found out, hey, there's no solution for that. And as you've seen uh, in Oliver's talk yesterday, um, there is a use case where you actually might want to have an instance to get all of the label information out of a specific network to then build your probes, which can attach labels for all, all existing paths in the network to your probing packets. Um, with this controller infrastructure we've got into in place, you can just put REST calls. I know he doesn't like REST, but we might come up with another API for him. Um, just calls into this controller, extract all of the label information out there, make, you, make, it, you, make it use it in one of your built tools, and then be done with it in the end. So for now, it's only a feasibility study. Nothing real in there. It works. It shows that we can actually do it. And it has lots of bits and pieces which can be inter interchanged. And most uh, significant of all, all of the bits and pieces are open source. So you can build the stuff yourself on open source solutions. You don't necessarily have to buy something from an existing vendor. You can actually do that by yourself. Um, that's pretty much of everything I wanted to cover. So um, if there are any questions left, I believe I've got two minutes or so um, before the next presentation starts. So feel free to address anything. So we have a break coming up, so we have all the time for questions if you want to. Coffee. Or coffee. That might have killed off all the questions. Okay, <laughs> then have fun with your coffee and see you back.